Sergeant, will you please begin your recordings? You see recording has started. Cloud has begun. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Sergeant Polite, mm -hmm. you begin with your opening statement. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the remote hearing on environmental protection, jointly with the subcommittee on capital budget. For council members and staff, please turn on a video at this time. Thank you. To minimize disruptions, please place all cell phones and electronics to vibrate. You may send your testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chairs, we are ready to begin. All right. Does Samara go first? Do I go I open? Um, <clears throat> I go first. Um, thank you. I'm Samara Swanston, Counsel to the Environmental Protection Committee of the New York City Council. Welcome to this joint hearing between the Environmental Protection Committee and the Capital Budget Subcommittee. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you're called on to testify when you'll be unmuted by the host. I'll be calling on panelists to testify. Please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelists are. We will begin with testimony from the administration, which will be followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to four minutes, including responses. I will call on you when it's your turn to speak. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function. And again, I'll call on you in order. I'll now hand it off to council, uh, Chair Constantinides, who will begin with his opening. Thank you, Samara. And, and happy Earth Month, everyone. I know Earth Day is not for a few weeks, but we should claim the entire month as Earth Month because we don't have the time any longer uh, to just limit our actions to one day. Uh, so good morning. Uh, my name is Costa Constantinidis. I am chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection. And today we will hold an oversight hearing jointly with the Capital Budget uh, Committee on Local Law 97 part of the Climate Mobilization Act and its implementation, along with pre-considered introduction, LS17080, uh, in relation to cities uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Local Law 97, passed almost two years ago now, represents the single largest carbon reduction effort that any city anywhere has ever put forward. It will result in the equivalent of taking more than a million cars off the road by 2030, once compliance starts. It also creates tens of thousands of good jobs for New Yorkers that need them the most, according to multiple independent studies. As everyone knows, Local Law 97 passed as part of the, a package of bills collectively known as the Climate Mobilization Act. We chose this name because these bill, bills merely represent the beginning and not the end of the city's response to the climate crisis. It is up to all of us, the public and private alike, to do our part to create a more sustainable city. Today, however, we must focus on city government's response to the framework created by this groundbreaking law. As part of Local 97, the law created the Office of Building Energy Emissions Performance, which is longer than my last name, and thus that's what we call it OB, uh, which is tasked with implementing the law separately uh, the administration pledged to increase the budget of the retrofit accelerator, committing to additional $30 million to their budget in the latest last fiscal year. Concerns have been raised, however, that this amount is not enough and that whether the accelerator will be able to serve enough buildings by the 2030 deadline. As my colleague, uh, Chair Rosenthal, will address in more detail, we must all examine our capital plan to meet the challenges ahead. Uh, 20, the, the, 20, the fiscal 2021 through 2025 preliminary capital commitment plan includes 1.37 billion for projects related to energy efficiency and sustainability. While the 10 year capital strategy includes 5.4 billion for miscellaneous energy and sustainability projects. 
Despite the administration including a large amount of funding towards energy efficiency and sustainability in both the preliminary capital commitment plan and the 10-year strategy, it is unclear whether these projects will directly support the city's efforts to comply with Local Law 97 and whether the funding is sufficient to meet the aggressive emissions targets set forth by the bill for city buildings. If Local Law 97's emission goals are met, it will represent a reduction of approximately 17 million tons of CO2 from a 2005 baseline by 2030. The equivalent of removing 3.6 million cars from the road for a year per year. Analysis suggests that retrofitting all 50,000 buildings covered by Local Law 97 by 2030 would generate nearly $25 billion in economic activity and potentially reduce energy consumption costs in retrofitted buildings by up to 30%. Proper implementation of the local law will not only put New York City on track to meet its climate commitments, but significantly reduce local emissions to the benefit of public health. On a final and, and more bittersweet note, uh, this is going to be my last hearing as chair of the Environmental Protection Committee. Uh, I've been a member of this committee since 2008. So that is 13 years. Uh, first, as a staff member to Council Member James Gennaro, who was the former chair and my political mentor. Uh, then, as a member of the committee, once I was elected under Chair Donovan Richards, now our Queensborough president. And then in June of 2015, I took over as chair. And you know, we, in the five years plus that I've been chair, we've passed 58 bills out of this committee, including the front the shut door bill geothermal and soil legislation, comprehensive environmental protection, uh, environmental justice protections, and of course, the Climate Mobilization Act and the Renewable Rikers Act. This committee has a record that all of us on the council can look back with on pride. And I'm profoundly honored to have had the opportunity to shepherd so many bills championed by so many amazing public servants, like my co-chair and my sister, Helen Rosenthal, uh, I've had wonderful speakers, uh, Melissa Mark the Burrito, and definitely our current speaker and my great friend and brother, Corey Johnson, uh, and others. And really the main public servants here are the staff. And really from the bottom of my heart, I really wanna thank, uh, I always thank them, but I really wanna thank them from the bottom of my heart. We've done so much great work together. You've become my friends and my family. And I'm so proud of the work that we've done together. And I look forward to seeing you in person because I kind of feel like I'm sneaking out the back door this way. But um, Samara, uh, Samara Swanson, our, our attorney, who has been my friend for 13 years. Thank you for honoring me with your friendship and your great work. Uh, Nadia Johnson, thank you for being such an amazing policy analyst and a great friend. Uh, Ricky Chala, I've known you a long time. Uh, and in political and out of government, thank you, Ricky. And Jonathan Seltzer, a financial analyst. Thank you, Jonathan, for, for putting up with me every budget cycle and for all the great work that you do as an amazing public servant. And of course, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Nick Wazowski, who I met uh, as an intern for Jim Gennaro. Uh, he's, you know, we've been friends for over a decade. Uh, he's worked on every piece of the legislation that we've passed, all 44 bills that I've done. Um, he's been an amazing public servant in his own right. And you know, I'm very lucky to have had him as part of my staff and part of my family. Um, so thank you, Nick. And uh, really thank you to everyone, the Sergeant at Arms and everyone who puts these hearings together. You are what make the city council go. You all are what make, give me optimism for the future. All the hard work that each and every one of the amazing public servants do. So with that, I'll hear testimony from the administration. And oh, first I'll pass it over to my co-chair, uh, my great friend and colleague, uh, Helen Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair Constantinides. That was incredibly generous um, and and well deserved gratitude all around. Um, that was wonderful to be a fly in the wall hearing that. Um, I'm Council Member Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the Subcommittee on the Capital Budget. Today's oversight hearing is on the implementation of Local Law 97, which is the cornerstone of the landmark 2019 New York City Climate Mobilization Act. 
And before I speak to the specifics of the law or the challenges of realizing its vital promise, I want to acknowledge the courage of its sponsor, Chair Constantinides. Since we were sworn in as council members together in 2014, Chair Constantinides has led our council's fight against climate change and has made New York City a leader in confronting its challenges and seizing on its opportunities with urgency. He's been driven by a clear moral vision and has had to overcome well-organized opposition to his bold ideas. I was sorry to learn that he will be retiring later this week and believe that today may be his final hearing at the council. So I want to take this opportunity to thank him for all of his hard work, not only in my capacity as his colleague, but as a New Yorker. You will be missed, Chair Constantinides. Local Law 97 creates emissions reduction standards for most buildings larger than 25,000 square feet, roughly 50,000 residential and commercial properties across New York City. These caps start in 2024 and will become more stringent over time, eventually reducing emissions by 80% by 2050. The law also mandates portfolio admissions reduction targets for city buildings starting in 2025 and NYCHA buildings starting in 2030. A great bill is only as strong as the efforts to implement it. So we need today's hearing to do a better understanding of what the city is doing, both with pending rulemaking and with strategic capital investments in city and NYCHA buildings to improve their emissions performance as is required by the law. In my capacity as chair of the Committee on Capital Budget, I'm especially focused on efficient and transparent capital project delivery. It's unacceptable when our public capital budget documents fail to clearly convey the scope and purpose of our city's capital spending, budget line by line. This is especially the case with the reporting of so-called energy efficient and sustainability projects. I should put air quotes around that because those are the words that are used in the official budget documents where we really don't know what the specific investments are or the projected emissions reduction we might expect as a result. How can we set an example to private landlords who, are, who were requiring to meet these standards faster on how to reduce building emissions without better articulating how we're going to do it for our own buildings? I'm excited today that we'll be hearing my pre-considered introduction, which will strengthen reporting on progress toward local law 97 goals for city and NYCHA buildings. Specifically, the bill would require that the carbon dioxide equivalent emission annual inventory reports already required by the law additionally include a list of current and future capital projects intended to reduce emissions from city government operations and NYCHA pursuant to the Climate Mobilization Act. And for each project, an estimate of the associated expected emission reductions resulting from such project. A project timeline, the total project budget for the project, the, sorry, the total projected budget for the project and the schedule of planned commitments and an estimate of the date by which the respective portfolio admissions reduction mandate will be achieved. My bill will also require that until the admissions reductions required of city government operations and NYCHA are achieved, each capital project set forth in the capital commitment plan that is intended to reduce emissions in accordance with the mandates shall be so designated therein. And with that, I turn it back to Chair Constantinides. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal, and really thank you for that very generous and kind words. You're my my friend and my sister. Thank you. And um, now, 
<laughs> I'll deliver the oath to the administration and I will call on each of you to individually record your answers to be followed by your testimony. Please raise your right hands. Anthony. Uh, first Commissioner Melanie DeRocca. <clears throat> Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, and now Gina Baroka, Chief, DOB Chief Sustainability Officer. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to the council member questions? I do. Thank you. And finally, uh, Anthony Fiore, DCAS, Deputy Commissioner of Energy Management. Anthony, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and on, respond honestly to the council member questions? Morning, Samara. I do. Morning. Thank you. You may begin your testimony when ready. Can I just, before anyone begins their testimony, I need to recognize that a few council members have joined the committee hearing. Thank you, Samara. Um, council member Mantraka from Brooklyn, council member Gennaro from Queens, uh, council member Adams from Queens, council member Brooks Powers from Queens, and council member uh, Gwadenchik from Queens. So Queens is in the house today. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Chair Costantinides, Chair Rosenthal, and members of the Committee on Environmental Protection and Subcommittee on Capital Budget. I am Melanie LaRocca, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Buildings, and I am joined today by Gina Bokra, the Department's Chief Sustainability Officer, as well as Anthony Fiore, Chief Energy Management Officer for the City and Deputy Commissioner for uh, energy management at the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. Collectively, we are pleased to be here to discuss the city's implementation of Local Law 97. Thank you for holding this important hearing today with Earth Day just around the corner. It's a good reminder of the work that still needs to be done to tackle global warming. I would also like to thank the chair, uh, Chair Costantinides, for being a great partner in the fight against climate change and to ad lib for a minute, I'd like to thank the chair for being a overall great person to work with uh, over the course of my tenure here at the department uh, and, uh, and certainly before. Um, we will be, uh, we will be uh, the city as a whole will be at a loss without you. I think you've been a great steward of good legislation uh, for a great cause. So thank you, chair. Uh, back to my testimony, sorry for that. Uh, Local Law 97, which is part of the Historic Climate Mobilization Act passed by this city council in 2019 requires the city's largest buildings to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions starting in 2024. Buildings are the largest source of greenhouse gas emission in the city. Uh, and this law supports the city's goal of, achieve it, of achieving carbon neutrality. While 2024 is still a few years away, the department has already started its work to fulfill its obligation to address greenhouse gas emissions coming from buildings. The department established the Climate Advisory Board in late 2019, which includes appointments made by both the mayor and the speaker of the New York City Council. And uh, this board is chaired by our chief sustainability officer. The advisory board is tasked with providing the department with guidance as it works to implement Local Law 97. Members are architects, engineers, property owners, representatives from the business sector and public utilities, as well as environmental justice advocates and tenant advocates. Last year, to supplement the work of the advisory board, we established eight climate working groups, many of which have already uh, started to meet to help develop best practices for building owners to comply with Local Law 97. To date, the advisory board and working groups have met over a hundred times, and we will continue to meet weekly throughout the rest of this year. I wanna thank the advisory board and working group members for their important contributions to this initiative uh, to date, thank you. Um, while the department's primary 
focus has been the advisory board and working group process. We've also started promulgating rules, which must be in place before 2023. This includes rules that allow the owners of covered buildings that are significantly over their emission limits and owners for uh, not-for-profit hospitals and healthcare facilities to apply to the department for an adjustment to their applicable emissions limits. And the rules are now final and will go into effect shortly, which will allow the department to begin accepting applications for the adjustments program as early as next week. The department has already begun conducting direct outreach to owners who could take advantage of this program, which includes sharing information about the adjustments program and how to apply. The department is also educating building owners of, it, of their obligation under local law 97 and will continue to work to educate owners leading up to 2024. To date, the department has updated its website to provide information to owners about the requirements of local law 97 and has established a dedicated email address to field inquiries from owners. We are using the inquiries we received to develop additional resources we can use to educate owners, which will include a website dedicated to Local Law 97. We are also informing new building applicants of their obligations under this law when they submit plans to the department so that they can start planning to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the very beginning of their construction projects. This work will continue through 2024 and beyond as the department makes additional progress in its implementation of Local Law 97. Moreover, the city continues to lead the way. Local Law 97 requires city government to go further and faster than the private sector. City government is required to achieve a 40% reduction in emissions by 2025 and a 50% reduction in emissions by 2030. In contrast, full private sector compliance is expected to yield approximately 40% reduction by 2030. DCAS serves as a central hub for energy management across all city agencies and manages a 3 billion 10 year capital plan to develop and implement programs to achieve the city's long-term 80% emissions reduction mandate and carbon neutrality goal by 2050. Since 2014, DCAS has invested more than 600 million in approximately 8,000 energy conservation measure, measures across 1,600 buildings, comprising uh, more than 50% of the city's building's square footage. By all measure, these investments are paying off. The investments have decreased energy use by about 2.3 million, uh, or about as much energy as used by 188,000 city residences, avoided more than 80 million in annual energy cost, and reduced emissions by about 220 metric tons, the equivalent of removing 48,000 cars from the road. All said, city government has reduced greenhouse gas emissions by 23%, compared to 15% for the private sector, and is uh, on its way to achieving both the near-term mandate of Local Law 97, as well as the long-term reductions client scientists, uh, science tells us are required to avoid the most catastrophic impacts of climate change. With that, I thank you again for the opportunity to testify before you today, and we would certainly welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner LaRocca, and it's been a pleasure to work with you in, in many capacities over the years. So thank you for your great service to the city. Um, I do have a few questions uh, and I'll hand it over to my co-chair. Uh, you just talked a little bit about um, OB, right? We talked in, in earlier in your testimony. Uh, how is OB uh, being staffed? Uh, you know, are we, do we have enough staff to meet the demand? of what is going on, uh, you know, how is there, and how many staff are currently there? Uh, are you working closely with DCAS and MOS? You know, how, what are the duties of OB? Sometimes I feel walk through sort of the entirety of, of OB in, in, a, in a very short time. Certainly, uh, and Gina can jump in as I uh, in, uh, inadvertently forget, forget things. So currently we have six positions for OB. Gina is the head of that group. Um, the OB uh, unit 
resides within our sustainability uh, bureau. Um, the staff of that unit are uh, critical components to the work of the advisory board and supporting the members of the advisory board. Uh, as I mentioned, half are appointees of the council as well as, uh, and the other half are appointees of the mayor. Um, that staff is really tasked with continuing to support that, uh, the work of the advisory board and the working group. Obviously, um, the, the anticipation is that OP grows as we progress um, further down uh, the road for Local Law 97. So while we're at six, we do anticipate um, uh, growth to take place. And we'll certainly uh, continue the conversations as we monitor the work uh, of the advisory board and the working groups to date and continue to plan for the evolving needs of OB, as I mentioned, as we get further down the road um, with 97 and the implementation of uh, Local Law 97. So if, if a building owner comes to OB today, um, do we have the staff to give them the technical support uh, to comply with the law? Because I know that's part of OBEEP's mission, right? Is to provide free technical support to building owners to be able to do their retrofit. Uh, so do we have that capacity currently? Yeah, I, I believe the I believe we do. And again, we we I touched on it briefly. We've established a dedicated website, which we will continue. Um, to add information to. Obviously, we're at the start of that as we get feedback from owners and feedback really being questions that will help drive us uh, yeah. in narrowing the universe of the information owners need um, and getting them actual practical information as well as the process we're starting right now for adjustments. So you'll see that start to ramp up um, certainly the early outreach we did in ensuring new applicants coming in were aware of 97 um, from the onset, I think is helpful. Um, and obviously um, where we can make adjustments, we will. And we are certainly, um, uh, you know, believe any and all suggestions in that front are valued and welcomed. Okay. Um, so you talked a lot about the advisory board. How is how are we doing in relation to the advisory board thus far? I know you've, you've talked about over 100 meetings thus far. Yeah. Um, so how are things going? Do we need more staff to help support the advisory board and the work that they're doing? Uh, what's sort of the future of OBEEP in relation to the advisory board and supporting that uh, important work that they're doing? If you could just you know, walk us through that. Sure, so the advisory board itself has met seven times. With the working groups, we've had uh, over 100 meetings. We'll continue that pace for the rest of this year. So the OB staff right now are supporting that work um, and all the work of the members uh, that make up those groups. And again, you know, we'll look at our staffing levels there, uh, but we do and always have expected that OB would grow as we make our way down the road. So um, that certainly is the expectation, but specific to the advisory board and its working groups, um, we'll continue to evaluate if we are able to meet the needs of those members and ways that we can continue to support them. And is, is, is an increase in OB in either staffing to help building owners or staffing, or staffing to the advisory, is that in this current budget? And the was it put in the preliminary budget or? Are we thinking about this for the, the yeah, something that we're gonna have to think about for the exact? Uh, it is certainly a conversation we are having uh, as we speak. Okay. All right. And I know that the state legislature, uh, I have like two more questions and I'll hand it back. To, I'll hand it back to my, my co-chair. And the state legislature is standing right currently against the part R uh, it, that, that you know, Governor Cuomo has put forth in his, his executive budget uh, that could undermine Local 197. Do we have any updates from the state legislature? I know they haven't come to a complete uh, resolution yet. I've not heard anything new from what you, anything different than what you've just shared, but certainly it's worth repeating our position on this, which is simply put, Local 197 was intended to increase energy efficiency in large buildings 
in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We all know that, but specifically for the betterment of local air quality in New York City. So obviously it is our position that we want RECs used towards generating uh, uh, better conditions for New York City. Okay. And then, so my last two questions are retrofit accelerator. Um, are, how are we doing with there as far as funding and supporting building owners? Again, with, you know, additional technical support. Uh, are, is more funding needed? Do they need to grow? Like sort of how are we doing with the retrofit accelerator? I mean, obviously the working group members in uh, on my st uh, the staff here, pardon me, of OB, who work with the working group and the advisory boards work very closely with our friends over at MOS and others. Um, so I understand they're doing okay, but I respectfully come will uh, uh, defer and come back should that answer be incorrect. Okay, and I guess the last question I have will be, I guess, more for DCAST and then uh, more for Anthony than for you, uh, Commissioner LaRocca. But uh, you know, we passed legislation several years ago around uh, capital construction evaluations for geothermal. We additionally passed legislation a few years ago uh, to, you know, to do a solar readiness check for every building. And there was a report uh, you know, in compliance with that. How are we doing with installing geothermal systems uh, and uh, in, in city capital projects? And how are we doing in relation to solar installations around city capital projects? Because um, I know there are many city buildings that are solar ready um, and that would absolutely be a retrofit that would be beneficial, would put people to work, it would reduce our emissions. And uh, we, did, we did one at, at 171 that was funded through city capital with Speaker Johnson and I, where now 50% of the, the emission, 50% you know, of the energy from that building now come from those solar panels. Um, so I'd wanna know like, what's our update on solarization and retrofitting and what's our, our, our update on uh, geothermal technology as well. Great. Uh, good morning, Chair. It's a pleasure to be here and talk with you during your, your last uh, hearing. Um, and I do appreciate the 58 bills that um, have been passed out of this committee. And um, I've enjoyed working on, on many of those with you. So um, you will be missed. You will be missed. Um, so with regards to, to the geothermal, um, I believe there's about 10 projects in total that have geothermal in the city. Um, some of the continued barriers to, to geothermal uh -huh. are the upfront capital costs that it's still quite expensive um, to do that. Those prices are starting to come down, but that's traditionally been one of the barriers. The other is, is just the density of underground infrastructure um, and the space required to install um, geothermal. But we, we believe geothermal um, has promise. I think, you know, as we continue to see those capital costs come down. We'll see more and more of those installations. Um, as you know, the Mayor's Office of Sustainability developed a tool to help um, the private sector um, find locations throughout the city that are most uh, amenable to geothermal by looking at, at different characteristics that make geothermal work. Um, so that's, a, that's an important tool that's out there. Um, with regard to solarization, um, We've, we've, since the beginning of this administration in FY14, we've gone mm -hmm. from about one megawatt um, to 12 megawatts now. So quite, quite a large in, increase. Um, that's across 87 different installations. Um, it's, th those installations are producing about 14.5 million kilowatt hours per year. And just to put that into context, that's, that's about as much as it would be required to power uh, 3,500 New York City residencies. Um, and we have about 171 uh, additional uh, projects that are actively being worked on now for another 41 megawatts um, over the next couple of years. So that'll put us more than um, halfway towards our goal. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that 65% of the projects that have been completed are in environmental justice communities. And we think that's great. And about 70% of the projects that are currently active um, are also in, in environmental justice communities. The other thing that I think is really important um, 
with the solarization program is education and training. And you mentioned the school in your district um, that, that we collaborated on to be done. And there's another five schools within your district that have solar on them to date. But um, overall, 1,300 teachers have been trained in solar and renewable energy um, and, and how to incorporate that into their curriculum. Um, over 1,700 students have been trained and uh, working with the Department of Education, uh, there's, we've engaged 13 different um, career and technical education schools and a thousand of those students uh, have been trained in solar. And then finally, um, we've been working with Solar, solar One and, and Fortune uh, 100 to have a program um, in, the, in the Department of Corrections where a hundred uh, inmates have taken a two-day course, an incarceration course, and then followed by a five-day um, uh, post-incarceration course. 61 um, uh, folks have taken that. 14 people have been hired from that program and 10 of those in, in clean energy. So we think that um, the solarization program is, is really starting to take off now. Really excited to hear that. And I know that we, we had a press conference just a few years ago, um, pre-COVID, about those five schools in my district, uh, other five schools. So I'm looking forward to seeing them come to fruition. Uh, I'm, you know, that's another conversation that I'll come back to after. But first, I want to uh, you know, hand it over to my co-chair, uh, Helen Rosenthal, uh, chair of the Capital Budget uh, Committee. And as also, I want to I recognize that Councilmember Gibson is here as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Constantinides, and um, thank you for kicking this conversation off to try to help us get a lay of the land. Really, all my questions have to do with um, uh, Commissioner LaRocca, the last paragraph of your testimony where you laid out some of the accomplishments made under uh, Local Law 97, which sound terrific. Um, but I just can't find them anywhere detailed anywhere in a public facing document. The only document that I see for the public to be able to track this is something called a uh, local law 24 solar readiness assessment of 2018. That seems to really nicely lay out um, the details of um, our movement toward uh, implementation of um, these, I mean, here at Solar specifically, but um, you know, it really does lay out building by building what the goal, wh what you've already achieved, what you're in sort of planning um, and exactly, I think it has in there how much was spent um, to get it to the place where it needs to be. but. I, I'm just not seeing anything. I, I love the achievements that you mentioned. And oh, by the way, hi, good to see you. Um, I think we had a hearing together last week, so I'm getting used to this. It's very <laughs> nice. Um, and I appreciate you're talking about this, but I'm not, I'm just not seeing it anywhere um, publicly. Sure. Thank you, Chair, for that. I, I'm going to ask my colleague Anthony to uh, take the mic on this and um, uh, walk through some of the some of the information DCAS has. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. Good morning. Nice to see Good you. Uh, nice to see you too. Yeah. Um, so there's there's several places uh, in public facing documents where you can find information. You mentioned one, the Local Law 24 report, which is specific to solar PV. Um, we also have the Local Law 87 report that reports on audits and retro commissioning work in buildings. Um, we also report um, through Local Law 84 uh, for benchmarking city buildings. Um, there's Local Law 45 that requires us to report on uh, fossil fuel usage in buildings um, as well as thermal, uh, thermal performance evaluations. Um, and then we have two additional um, uh, reports that will be coming out soon. One on um, related to energy storage and you know kind of the best fit in building typologies for that technology, and another one on solar thermal. 
um, all of this really gets wrapped up and, and culminated um, in the annual greenhouse gas inventory report that shows the um, outcomes from all this work um, and, and really you know, illustrates where we are in the progress towards both our near-term emission reduction goals and our long-term emission reduction goals. Okay, I'm clearly gonna have to look at that more carefully. I mean, I think, and, and my bill sort of calls for this, it sounds like it's in a lot of different places you could piece this together. Although let, let me go back to it just one more for one more round. So um, at the end of uh, Commissioner Laraca's testimony, it says, she says that DCAS has invested more than 600 million in approximately 8,000 energy conversion measures across 1,600 buildings, uh, which is about 50%. So, so where do I see that? information. Is that in the emissions tracker you're talking about? Um, <clears throat> yeah, the emissions report, the annual greenhouse gas inventory report, sums all of that up and it looks um, at uh, emission reduction achievements across different sectors. So you'll see right. it for Is buildings. That not what I'm looking for. I, I'm looking for city buildings and sort of building by building how much money have we invested using, you know, what type of energy cons conservation measure and what the output has been. Um, I mean, it says all, all said city government has reduced greenhouse gas emissions by 23%. And that sounds great. Where do I see that? That would be in the annual greenhouse gas inventory report. You know what, can you, oh, I guess we can't use a chat, but um, can you, so I'm gonna just Google it really quickly. What should I search for, DCAS? I, I would search for um, New York City Greenhouse Gas Inventory Report. Sorry. I mean, not sorry. I'm I'm looking it up because, um, and and are you saying that in there I'll see a summation by sector, or I'll see what New York City has done with our buildings? I see the report now. Yeah, it's it's separated into um, public sector and private sector, so you can see them together, and you can see them broken apart. And in the public sector, I see that citywide inventory, New York City government inventory. Um, can I see again? And I think the answer is no, because I'm zipping through this. But by building in New York City, by government building, what have we invested in what? And what's that gotten us? Yeah, it's not going to show that in this report. Right. Is there a report that does? Uh, that shows investments by building and, and projects by building, no. So I guess that's what I'm calling for in my legislation. Is there, and hypothetically, there are documents behind this document that I'm looking at, although you can't see that because this is Zoom, but I am looking at the emissions report on my screen and uh, hypothetically, behind that report, a whole bunch of information feeds into it, right? That is building by building. Correct. So that uh, emission, that information is available, though, right? And so hypothetically, without doing a lot of work, that information could be put into a dashboard. It's uh, certainly a lot of information, as you've mentioned, as the commissioner mentioned, over 8,000 different energy conservation measures. So um, yes, in theory- When you say 8,000 conservation measures, you mean, you mean using like four techniques in 8,000 buildings, right? No, I, I mean 8,000 different um, measures that have been implemented. So fixing a steam trap or 
sure. boiler controls or, sure, sure. you know, that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I mean, I, I'm still not hearing why it's hard. But let well, me say it a different way. I didn't hear, um, this is a pre-considered introduction, so I don't know that all y'all have had a lot of time to look at this legislation, but do you see any challenges for implementing a public-facing dashboard? Um, yeah, I have not seen the introduction. I apologize, I was out um, on Friday of last week, so no I've not seen, that, okay. not seen that yet. Um, I think, you know, uh, the concept of um, transparency is one that um, we feel is important and appreciate. And I think, um, you know, I'd like to have the opportunity to look at that introduction more and understand if there are any challenges uh, to, to doing that and working with you to, to lay out something that will serve that transparency um, objective that you're looking to get at. Oh, that's terrific. I appreciate it. So how much money has the city put in um, currently? Maybe let's just talk about over the next five years for implementation of local law 97. Over the next five years. Yeah, or, or you can talk yeah. about and specifically for fiscal year 21 and 22. And I'm gonna ask, so for fiscal year 21, given the hardship of the pandemic and the pause, where are we in accomplishing those goals? And then are we on track for the next fiscal year? That's gonna be yeah. sort of the run of the questions. Yeah, so I, I, you know, the four year, um, our four year capital budget has about $1.3 uh, billion in it. Um, for fiscal year 21, um, our, our capital budget was 114 million. Um, we're expecting to uh, spend about 95 million of that uh, in projects. And for fiscal year 22, um, we have a budget, a capital budget of $280 million. Okay, and can you just clarify again? I had thought it was 1.2 billion over a 10 year period. You're now saying that's over a four year period? It's a it's a three billion dollar ten year capital budget. Okay, so so this year and next year you're going to be at adding it together around two hundred million, and you're expecting in the next three years to spend another billion. It, again, we have um, about two hundred eighty million in our fiscal year twenty two budget. Oh, sorry, um, two eighty plus. Yeah. So you're at three four hundred million. Yeah. Out of um, and, yeah, and and then you know, the, the outer years, um, you know, there's there's a total budget. It's programming capital projects towards towards that budget, and that's what you know we're we're working toward. I'm sorry, I'm just asking a really simple question. One point three billion over four years sounds like you you're you can see between this year and next year spending around four hundred million. So that means you've got about for over two years, you have to achieve $900 million in spending. So are you expecting to be able to spend 400 million, 450 million each of those two years? Or are you now thinking you're gonna be pushing that out farther into the 10 year plan? Yeah, $400 million per year over the next two years will be difficult to achieve, uh, yes. Okay, and so I guess what my lay brain is thinking about is like if you have a set of goals that you want to achieve, you sort of, you know, as you said, 8,000 different ways of achieving, you know, emissions reductions. How, what's your, you know, strategic plan or timeline to get to your achieved goals? And I guess what I'm wondering is, can you just, I mean, again, it's sort of the, the what feeds into your emissions report, the background material, can you show that over time, you're gonna spend this much money in this year, which is gonna have X, um, per, X you know, reduction, percent reduction or total reduction in emissions, 
you know, two years after that. So it, I mean, in many ways it's, it is sort of that simple, right? And it's just that there are a lot of entries because we're a big city, but can you, have you laid that out? And the reason that's important is, you know, if you're saying over the next four years, you're not going to be able to spend 1.2, 1.3 billion, but instead you'll you'll be able to spend, I mean, at the current rate, even if you did 300 million a year, you know, that'd be six, uh, you know, maybe 900 million, eight or 900 million. So you, you're falling short on spending. Where does that push us out in achieving our goals? Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like you already know which projects fit into those millions well, of dollars. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, we, we certainly don't know every project that could be implemented over the next 10 years. We are now working on an implementation action plan associated with Local 197. We've been working on that for the past uh, six months. Um, we should have that finished up in, in a, another few weeks, so about four weeks, and that oh. should be finished. And that's, going, that's doing exactly what you're saying. It's looking at um, all the different building typologies, which agencies have which typologies, what types of measures fit to each building typology, and then laying out kind of a, a pace and schedule to what you would need to do in order to achieve those emission reductions, both by 2025 and 20, 2030. So that, that is in progress right now, and that, that will be a report that, that lays that out. And will that report be public facing? Yes. Okay, so the public can expect within a month, I'm giving you a little bit of a grace, that Thank within you. a month that document will be up on the DCAS website? I, I think so. It will be public facing the exact timing of it. I'm not sure of, but it will be a public facing document. Okay, and that'll basically be our roadmap. Correct. Will include in that, will we see, so as you're thinking about the projects that go into that document, are they prioritized in some sort of way? And what's your criteria for prioritizing? Um, <clears throat> well, it's basically the biggest impact for the dollar invested, right? So how can we get the most greenhouse gas emissions out of that? Now, that being said, um, when we look at these investments, we also look at um, how those investments touch other policy objectives. So, you know, we do look at um, the investments in terms of environmental justice communities. We look at the investments in terms of resiliency benefits, air quality benefits, and attended public health benefits, um, uh, reliability, uh, and so forth. So, um, you know, we, we want to be able to try to get the, the most out of each, each dollar invested, but we also look at how these touch other policy objectives. And so we'll see that in your tracker, right? I'm sorry, I, I already asked you that and you said yes, but I'm just liking what I'm hearing and just want to confirm that'll be clear. Well, <laughs> there'll be a qual some qualitative discussion about, you know, other policy objectives, but how you know, right. where, where the emission reduction opportunities are will be laid out. And will it also have the tracking of what has happened already to date? The, this is a forward, this is a forward looking report. So oh. I, yeah. So it's the only place to see what's happened to date, the emissions tracker, which is this sort of, um, not specifics, but sort of overall document? That, yes. Okay. Um, and so, and, and in your forward looking document, who will it be that'll track um, implementation? Well, again, DCAS serves as the central hub for this across the agency. So we'll be getting information from the agencies to put that together. Okay, just checking. Um, all right, so one of the things that we found challenging is um, we look in the capital budget, which is a public facing document to try to identify these projects, right? For, for at least for these four years. Um, and it, the, the labeling seems um, not consistent. 
Um, sometimes in a budget line title, it'll say energy efficiency and sustainability. Sometimes in a project title, it'll say solar. Um, and so I'm wondering, is there some way to um, have consistency in that so that I'm making this up for every budget line in addition to whatever it says, it just could say LL97 in it. Could you do that? Um, so, so there's, there's a budget title and there's a project yes. title and the, the budget titles are generated by OMB. So I can't, I can't speak to that piece of it. I, I just don't know. The project titles um, are developed by the managing agency. So where DCAS is uh, providing the, the project, where we're managing the project and implementing it, um, that's directly within DCAS's control. The, otherwise, it would be the agency that's implementing the project. Um, I, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in this area, but I, I, I do believe in some instances agencies upload a, a, a bunch of projects into the system. And, I, and I'm not sure how much detail they have when they, they do that. But I think, I think something where you, there, there's gotta be some way to code it so that it's, it's more transparent. But I, I just can't speak to the specifics of how that might be done or, or how easy it is to do at, at this moment. Let's talk about it offline. I mean, I okay. guess I'm hearing you say, you know, it, it, like at first blush, it sounds like, well, OMB can just put in, you know, LL97, but you're sort of saying, well, how would they know, right? It's really the yeah. agency that would know. So it would have to be a directive that goes out to all agencies that if you're uploading something having to do with local law 97, they would have to add that to the project title. Is that what I'm sort of hearing? I, I believe so. Yes. Do you think that would be hard to do? I, I don't know. I, I just don't know enough about this, but uh, I think it's certainly something we can talk about. Great. Um, and is there a difference between what might be a local law 97 project versus a sustainability project? Or could we assume they're the same thing? Well, I think sustainability is, is a broad term, right? I, I mean, I think... <clears throat> um, where we're looking at emission reductions that may not take into account things about such as improving water quality or, you know, um, things of that nature. So uh, again, I, I, you know, I just yeah. think sustainability is a broader okay. term. So let's, let's really sit down and, and hash this out because again, it gets to transparency and, you know, accountability and we have noticed that there are some things that OMB is able to track. Um, for example, there's local law five that's you know in a budget line. Um, so you know having to do with fire detectors. Uh, so let's let's try to. Do you think that could be something D DCAS could help us champion? <laughs> yeah, I, I think we're very happy to continue this conversation with you. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you so much, um, Chair Consumides. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Deputy Commissioner. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. Uh, I want to make sure I recognize uh, Councilmember Eric Ulrich and Councilmember uh, Matteo has both joined us. Thank you both for being here. And I know that Councilmember Gudenchik has his hand up and he'd like to ask some questions as well before I come back for a second round. Thank you. Time starts now. Chair, uh, thank you, Chair Costa, and thank you, Chair Rosenthal. Um, I just want to, before I ask my questions, um, which will not be too rigorous, I promise you, Commissioner LaRocca, um, I do want to uh, recognize that this is the last hearing for my uh, dear friend and brother from another mother, uh, Chair Costa Costantanidis. Um, he leaves us uh, uh, bereft of uh, not just uh, an outstanding chair and council member, but um, just a, a great all around human being. And uh, certainly 
I don't think there's anybody in New York City Council that would um, would oppose my statement that I make this morning. But I want to say for the record that I made this all possible because had I not lost to Jim Gennaro in 2001, he would never have been able to hire you. So I'm taking credit for everything you've ever done in your life. Um, with that, with some levity, um, Jim is now a dear friend and we are both members of the 188th Street Caucus. Um, I want to ask um, the commissioner, and I don't know if this is really fair to ask her, but she's um, so adept and such a wonderful person to work with. And we've done so many great things before she was commissioner as the chief of staff at the SCA. And we've got 2,600 seats under construction. Thank you, uh, commissioner. And of course, my hat tip as well to former commissioner Grillo. But um, is there an overall czar or czarina that's in charge of making sure that the city complies with this law? Um, and I ask that because having um, grown up in New York City public housing and um, in Pominock houses in, in Councilman Gennaro's district, uh, I am concerned um, about implementation there very much so. Um, uh, you know, uh, if, if NYCHA was its own city, it would be the second largest city in the state of New York uh, easily um, with uh, officially 400,000 residents, but probably uh, at least another 100 to 200,000 residents. And uh, the folks living in NYCHA deserve um, to be as energy efficient as, um, as anybody else in New York City. I'm just wondering if there is anybody that is tasked by this law or by this mayor, and I realize that his, his time is less than nine months now, but just curious about that. Thank you, council member. And, uh for your generosity, so it's a pleasure. Um, I don't know that there's a, a czar um, in the sense that you're putting, you're putting it out there, but there certainly are very critical components of the city's overall effort here to both address city-owned buildings uh, and controlled buildings, as well as the private sector. Um, certainly the department will play a role in that um, as we started. Um, but then again, we have DCAS, who's uh, taking charge of the city's capital investments. We have our colleagues over at MOS. So um, no, in the traditional sense, but we all are collectively uh, swimming the, the same way. I, I appreciate that. And I know it's not your responsibility. Um, I have, as many of uh, my colleagues and uh, many of the people of the city, been disturbed by um, the seeming lack of progress in and simple tasks that need to be basic quality of life matters that um, need to happen at NYCHA. Um, and I just worry that this is a lot on their plate. Um, however, I'm gonna look optimistically forward and uh, uh, hope that uh, better days are ahead um, for NYCHA um, as they were for me growing up in, uh, in what was paradise, really a real paradise. Anyway, um, again, I want to thank uh, the chairs for indulging me and wish my friend, my dear friend Costa, um, Godspeed. I know uh, that our loss is the variety Thanks, of girls called Gain, and uh, I look forward to uh, taking a tour of that facility with you in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember uh, Garodnik. Thank you. I had to do that one last time. Yeah, I had to do it one last time. That's okay. If I, if I have to be compared to somebody like Dan Garodnik, that's a pretty damn good thing. But, but, I, but I love you, brother, and thank you for all your great work in the city of New York. And thank you. My brother. Thank you. Um, I see that Councilmember Gennaro also has questions. I will turn it over to him at this time. Time starts now. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. I just wanted to, uh, 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 I wanted to be associated with uh, uh, Barry's remarks and, um, and uh, on, on, on two matters on, 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 you know, lauding Costa for the, for the, for the, for the great chair, for the great public servant, for the great, um, for, the, for the great person that he is. Um, he talks about me a lot, but a lot of my successes are really due to his great work for me back when we were laboring in the vineyard together. And I regret that our time together on the council won't be as long as uh, it, it, it would have otherwise been. But, um, you know, Costa and I have been friends a long time and friends and brothers. Um, and um, yeah, I, I look forward to that relationship uh, continuing. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm 
sad day for the council, a loss for the council, a loss for the city, but us will go on to do other great thing and make his mark. And because that's who he is, as we all know. And um, so thank you, Costa. And Barry, thank you for raising the point. First of everything you've said, but you know, getting into the uh, you know, NYCHA thing, um, you know, when I when I read the report about NYCHA, <clears throat> um, um, as you uh, uh, appropriately indicated, Barry, it, it's just, there's so much on NYCHA's plate now and basic, basic stuff on heat, hot water, mold control, roofs leaking, you know, just getting the buildings, you know, even getting the bricks pointed. It just, uh, um, the pointing is the stuff that goes in between the bricks. I think everybody knows that. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, Fear that um, you know, you know, more of an onus on this on, on this fragile and stressed, um, you know, system that we know as NYCHA. Um, uh, you know, we all wanted to succeed and be uh, and, and be healthy and robust and also you know climate friendly. Um, but I, you know, have a, I think a legitimate fear that more put on NYCHA's plate is going to, you know, um, you know, result in some problems. Um, I'll just leave that as a comment for the record. Um, um, I thank the commissioners who are uh, appearing before the uh, 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 committee today for your good work to move forward Costas and the committee's good work. Um, and I appreciate that. I don't have, have any specific questions regarding I me, mean, I, I, you know, other than just putting my statement on the record. So Costa, it's been great to serve with you for all these years and we will uh, continue our our you know, deep and abiding lifelong friendship um, going forward. So thank you, my brother. Um, and um, Godspeed. And thank you also, Barry, for your kind remarks. And so with that said, I uh, I, um, I, I turn it back. So uh, God bless everyone. Happy Easter Monday. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Councilman Gennaro. Um, you know, 13 years ago, I walked into your office on my birthday, January 7th, uh, to uh, my first day at work. And I got to learn about, about sustainability and I got to learn about the council and I, I got to become your friend and your brother. So I'm, I'm, I count myself in the very lucky category. Uh, uh, um, I think I got the best of the bargain on this one, but I, I, I certainly appreciate the compliment. But I, I, you know, I got the best of the bargain. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Um, so with that, um, I guess I'm going to turn it back and, and get back to the, the, the task at hand. I do have some, a few more questions left for the commissioners. Uh, I'll put that, I'm not sure who can answer this question, but I know that there was a carbon trading study that was mandated by Local 197 that was due January 1st. Um, do we know when the study is going to be released uh, at this point? So... Uh, I'll take a stab and Anthony and Gina wants to jump in. I know MOS uh, has been working on that and we do expect it uh, shortly. Gina and, or Anthony, if you have more details. And can I add a wrinkle to that question? Um, and what also have we done around ensuring that EJ communities have meaningful participation in that study? Gina or Anthony, if you have a better sense of timing, and then I'll have to come back to you on, on the uh, participation piece, Council Member. Thank you. Council Member, I uh, apologize that we don't have additional details on how they have been engaged. I do know that MOS has worked to engage EJ communities within the study, but I can't offer any detail. Okay. Um, so I'll ask a question around PACE. I know that MOS is not here. Um, but I know we recently passed uh, an addendum to PACE to make it easier for new construction as well. Uh, we haven't yet, have we, have, has PACE started? We talked about spring. Um, have we issued any, have we chose a provider? Have we issued any PACE loans yet? Um, do we have an estimated date on when that's going to start? Gina, I don't know if you have the... Uh, details here, but if you do, I, I don't have additional details. But council member, I do know there was rulemaking that um, was finalized, and I believe is in effect now to to facilitate that and move it forward. Okay, um, around rent related buildings, I know that uh, um, you know 
I know it is 1947, but it's actually local law now, 116 of 2020, uh, amended the definition of rent regulated uh, accommodations to include dwellings in which 35% or more of the dwelling units are required to be rent regulated. Um, how are we doing on implementing local law 116 of 2020 into the local law 97 compliance and, and assisting building owners in meeting those targets? So I'll start, but just obviously <clears throat> part of the critical part of what we do is how we get the word out. So we look forward to working with the council on ways to strengthen that. And again, as I mentioned before, obviously uh, any and all would be appreciated here because we do realize that's critical. Gina, do you want to chime in a little more? <clears throat> Sure, Commissioner, thank you. I, I think uh, the department is working closely with uh, MOS and the state to try and figure out how we get that information pinned down, um, how we are able to reach out to owners, um, help them better understand their obligations under Article 321. Uh, we are aware many owners believe they have no obligations under Local Law 97 whatsoever if they're rent regulated, which is um, which is something that we need to, to work harder to, to message about. And in addition to that, we're working more broadly, um, not just on, on the topic of rent regulation, but other types of affordable housing are treated differently under Local Law 97. It can be confusing. So MOS, DOB, and HPD are also working on uh, better messaging about how the law applies to the different types of affordable housing that are out there. Okay, so we'll be able to give building owners clear understanding of where things are and ensure that they understand whether their building is, is in need of doing the retrofits, whether they have to do the alternative compliance. So there's no ambiguity, right? Because we don't wanna leave building owners in a bad place where they get closer to a date of 2024, 2030, and they're unsure, right? We're able to give them some type of certainty that Yes, you're part of alternative compliance, or yes, you're part of Local 97 compliance, you need to get working uh, on a capital plan, correct? Yeah, that's definitely the expectation that we're able to facilitate those conversations. Great. Um, and then lastly, uh, I know that NYCHA is not here, but I know both of my colleagues, both Councilmember Grudenchik and Councilmember Gennaro, uh, both uh, brought up the issues around NYCHA. Um, do we know what reason? I know that NYCHA is a goal and not a mandate because we have uh, limited capacity to uh, work around NYCHA issues based on the, the federal and the state both having hands in what we do at NYCHA. Um, do we know if there, what resources have been allocated to comply with Local 197? Uh, you know, do we know uh, what, uh, what NYCHA will be able to achieve by 2030? Um, is there any sort of planning around Local 197 uh, relating to funding to NYCHA or uh, in the city budget that's going to help them meet their goals? Because we don't want to create a, a tale of two cities, right? A, a, a public housing being left out of this important law because in addition, when we do retrofits, it not only is, is beneficial uh, making the building itself more valuable, but it's also you know, reduces emissions and, and improves air quality. So we're not going to burn as much fossil fuels and we're going to see an improved air quality in the residents at NYCHA uh, most certainly should share in that. So do we know what resources we're dedicating uh, around local law compliance at NYCHA? I don't. And uh, again, I would be happy to come back uh, with that. Okay, great. If you could please update uh, my co-chair, uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, uh, with that information or whoever the chair of the committee is. Uh, once I've, I've uh, gone on to uh, the private sector, that would be wonderful. Yes. Okay. Um, does any other of my colleagues have any other questions for any of the administration before I move on to, oh, Council Member Rosenthal has a, a question, so I will hand it back to our chair. Thank you. I, I just, um, two quick questions. I didn't quite hear the answer even to your set of questions just now, Council Member Constantinides. Is DCAS tracking the NYCHA outcomes? No, NYCHA is not part of our portfolio. Um, we, you know, we do uh, collaborate with NYCHA really kind of on best practices um, and lessons learned, but their, their, their portfolio is very, very different than the city government portfolio at large. Um, you know, large multifamily housing is just very different than 
you know, our, our schools and our police precincts and our cultural institutions. Um, and so the solutions are, uh, the challenges are a little bit different and the solutions are a little bit different. Um, I, I will tell you that we, we've just met with them about a program um, that in conjunction with NYSERDA that they're looking to do um, in trying to incentivize manufacturers to produce a, um, a, a new type of um, air source heat pump that would be um, suitable for multifamily residencies, uh, very efficient. Um, and we're seeing if there's a way that DCAS could participate in that. Again, it's a very different application, but those are the types of conversations that we have with uh, NYCHA. Thank you for that. And then um, similarly, uh, of the work that's been done to date, what portion of it has been done in uh, EJ communities? I don't know what the measurement is or how you um, look at that. I mean, is it X percent of your projects or X percent of the emission reductions to date? But how much has been done already in EJ communities? Uh, from the from the projects that we've completed to date, 55% of the emission reductions are in EJ communities and 75% of PM 2.5 reductions are in EJ communities. Okay, great. And I look forward to hearing more from the advocates uh, about that later on. I hope you'll stick around for that as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. Um, so I will just at this point, did any of my colleagues have any questions for any of the administration? Before we move on, I just wanna do a double check here because we're not in person. All right, so not seeing any hands. I really wanna thank uh, uh, Commissioner LaRocca, Anthony Fiore, uh, Gina Boca. Thank you all for being amazing public servants. It's really been an honor to work with you over this time. Uh, and I am so grateful uh, for the administration's partnership over the years. So I look forward to seeing you all in a different capacity soon and wishing you all well. And I know that you'll continue to do great work on the path to people to speak for. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So Mara, I guess we can call the next witness. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. We'll now turn to the public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for particular panelists should use the raise hand function in Zoom. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant of Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant of Arms to announce that you may begin before you begin your testimony. And again, I think our testimony will be limited to four minutes. I would like to now welcome Marcia Ennenberg, who represents 350.org New York City to testify to be followed by Kevin Costa of 350.org Brooklyn. Hi, everybody. Before Time I, starts now. Oh, before I begin, I'd like to address Chair Constantinides on behalf of 350 New York City. You've been such a role model and an inspiration. And it's um, so upsetting that you are going to be retiring, but I hope in the future you will find some role to play in continuing to help New York City with their environmental protection. It's been an honor to work with you. <laughs> My name is Marcia Annenberg, and I'm a member of 350NewYorkCity.org, affiliated with the international climate group 350.org. We advocate for policies that serve to eliminate and draw down greenhouse gas from the atmosphere. We are here today to add our voice to the strong coalition of activists in New York City that is adamant that Local Law 97 be implemented without delay and that the projects necessary to be completed by 2022 are fully funded. The question we must ask ourselves here at this time and in this place is whether we believe that the earth is in a state of emergency. In 2019, 11,000 scientists from 165 countries signed a letter 
saying that we are on the verge of a calamity. Unfortunately, we are the last generation and the only generation tasked with saving the earth from one away global warming. We didn't ask for this responsibility, but nonetheless, it is ours. Data has shown that buildings generate 70% of the greenhouse gas emitted from New York City. That is a fact. This must be reduced by 40% by 2030. Our polar ice caps are melting. They are not going to stop melting. The sea level will continue to rise. The storm surge from Sandy was a historic 13.88 feet. What if the storm surge comes up to 34th Street next time? What will the landlords do then? Who will save them? How many water pumps will they need? The question then isn't whether to upgrade their buildings. The question is how fast can they be, can they be upgraded? If local law 97 is implemented, implemented, New York City buildings emissions will be reduced by 80%. There is no more time to wait. Like the greatest generation of World War II tasked with defeating Hitler, it is our task to make the world safe for our children and grandchildren. Instead of inheriting a planet beset by drought, wildfires, torrential rain, and species extinction. Thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you again. Thank you, Thank so you Marcia, for your testimony. <clears throat> um, I'd like to call Kevin Costa. If Kevin Costa is available, he can turn on his camera now. If not, let's move on to Joseph Zurica of the American Council of Engineering Companies of New York, who will be followed by Pete Sikora of New York Communities for Change. Time starts now. Good morning, Chair Constantinides and members of the committee. Thank you for letting me speak to you today. Uh, my name is Josephine Zurica and I'm a principal at Dagger Engineering. Uh, but I am also the Vice Chair of the American Council of Engineering Companies of New York's uh, Energy Code Committee, and I am speaking on their behalf today. Uh, I just want to emphasize that our members are licensed professional engineers who serve on a volunteer basis, and uh, we're speaking here today because of the impact um, that this you know, legislation has on our uh, member firms and the work that we do. Uh, I just want to emphasize that ACEC New York has been supportive of the intent of Local Law 97 since its first draft as Intro 1253, and we've been active throughout providing comments and testimony um, and technical insight. And uh, we do have a, 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 a couple of comments today um, on the current state of the uh, legislation. So our first uh, comment is um, to stress the need for dedicated resources within DOB. Uh, two years after its historic passage, Local Law 97 remains some of the most ambitious legislation of its kind. And as we all know, it will be one of the most challenging to successfully implement. And uh, as engineers, we certainly want to see this bill successfully implemented in the work that we do. We have uh, members of ACEC who sit on both the advisory board and the working groups. Um, and we closely follow, have been closely following the implementation of this law. Um, you know, we understand that Local Law 97 charges the advisory board to issue a report and recommendations in less than two years from now. And there's a concern that at the current pace of rulemaking and implementation, there remain too many unknowns for design teams, consultants, and building owners to pop properly react and start implementing the real changes and improvements that are needed uh, for Local Law 97 to be a success. So uh, at ACEC, we strongly recommend that uh, further attention is made to the implementation of this law uh, within DOB and the re resources that are provided to it. Um, secondly, I want to bring up a point um, that I know has been brought up previously in terms of how the bill, um, how the uh, 
carbon is uh, classified. Um, so currently the New York uh, DOB building occupancy classification is being used in the bill. And we continue to believe that this is an inappropriate way to set limits as it ignores too many indicators of carbon and energy usage within a building. Um, specifically, it's not nuanced enough to recognize different energy intensities um, and how different building types are used, including occupancy densities, operating schedules, and other factors that can significantly uh, affect the carbon consumption. Um, we strongly recommend that the Energy Star Building Classification System is a more appropriate way to categorize and set limits uh, for carbon. Uh, this system is nationally recognized and currently utilized in the city's benchmarking law and is a much more appropriate way to classify the type of building and resulting energy and carbon intensity. And I thank you very much for uh, listening to this testimony today. Thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony and your partnership. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Josephine. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, now I will call on Pete Sakura of New York Communities for Change, whose testimony will be followed by Adam Roberts of the American Institute of Architects of New York. Time Pete starts now. Time starts now. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me now. I was unmuted, but uh, thank you so much for this time. And thank you, Council Member Constantinides, for your work. Um, it is uh, a bittersweet moment, this hearing um, on oversight of the law that you and the council shoved through. Everyone here should be uh, on the council should be really proud of this. It's a monumental accomplishment that will last for decades and will be one of the things that's looked back on as one of the biggest things that the city ever really did uh, to lead the world. Um, I don't really you know, do a lot of hyperbole, but it's, it's really true. Thank you so much for passing Local Law 97. Um, the real estate industry is on the attack here on Local Law 97, as we're all aware. Um, hopefully the state legislature will defeat the governor and Rebney and some of the other Rebney affiliates attack through Part R. We're looking good on that. Um, but that bad faith attack is typical of the kind of stuff that we're seeing now. The real estate industry try to sling at uh, the city. They lost on local law 97. Um, they had previously defeated Mayor Bloomberg's attempt to do something in this area. And they are always trying to uh, stop requirements that require them to do anything uh, hugely significant. And that's what's needed uh, in order to create good jobs to solve the climate crisis. So. Again, thank you, Costa and council members for moving this law through and holding this hearing. Um, the administration, to its credit, has appointed um, highly talented people. You're hearing from some of them uh, to run OBEEP, and that is great. Um, they are working overtime here to stand up the law and make it real. But I want to echo the need for increased resources here. Um, staff lines in particular. There needs to be more and you need to put them in the budget right now, make the administration do it. Um, so please add staff lines in the baselines uh, for uh, the office and the associated functions. Incredibly important. It's a tiny, tiny amount of money. We say that a lot about various budget stuff, but in this case, it is a law that is standing up tens of thousands of good jobs and that process has already begun. Um, it's important to have the right staffing levels there and they're behind right now. They need more talented people like they have. Um, we, uh, we want to see local law 97 strengthened. Uh, so, so that includes limiting recs, closing some of the loopholes on 80, 20 buildings on section eight housing. Those don't make any sense. Um, and local law 97 uh, should be strengthened by bringing up the effective dates um, to create more jobs and cut pollution faster. Um, the benefits here uh, are enormous. It's to uh, create good jobs to cut pollution. And um, again, thank you so much for doing this. You have our prepared testimony, um, but I want to end by saying that there's good faith disagreements among energy efficiency experts on how to structure this kind of a law. It's so innovative that there's no really good roadmap. So I really want to distinguish between good faith discussions and disagreements, which are happening at the advisory council and bad faith BS that the real estate industry is flinging at this law. Um, so 
their lobbyists need to be re rejected and you need to move forward on strengthening the law and increasing standards for other types of buildings as well as passing uh, a ban on gas installations on new construction and gut renovations. Um, for New York City to survive this existential crisis and thrive, we have to fight the crisis and take hold of the job creation opportunity. We thank you for passing Local Law 97 and, and, uh, and for uh, this oversight hearing. Thank you very much. And thank you, Pete. Thank you, Pete. <laughs> Uh, I would now like to welcome Adam Roberts of the American Institute of Architects of New York, whose testimony will be followed by Carlos Costel Croak of the New York League of Conservation Voters. Time starts now. Thank you, Chairs Constantinides and Rosenthal for holding this hearing today. And also congratulations, Chair Constantinides, on your retirement. And thank you so much for all the great work that you've done over the years on Local Law 97 and, and other bills. I'm Adam Roberts, the Director of Policy for the American Institute of Architects New York, also known as AIA New York. We represent New York City's public and private sector architects. AIA New York has and will continue to be a strong supporter of Local Law 97. However, we feel, fear that a lack of city resources will hamper the law's effective enforcement. Without effective enforcement, New York City will fail to combat climate change and the inequality in living and working conditions, while also missing out on an opportunity to provide much needed jobs in the design and construction industries. Most urgently, the city must commit to properly funding the Office of Building Energy and Emissions Performance, which is housed within the Department of Buildings. The office is severely understaffed, with only a handful of staffers overseeing compliance for thousands of the city's largest buildings, potentially allowing unscrupulous owners to skirt requirements. Furthermore, the staff shortage complicates this office's ability to take on further responsibilities and initiatives related to, to compliance with Local Law 97, such as providing education on sustainable design techniques. The city should also invest further in those agencies that oversee capital works, as they are integral in ensuring that city buildings comply with the law's provisions. While the mayor has finally relented and allowed the design of public projects to restart after a year-long halt, city buildings are nonetheless a year behind schedule on compliance. Additional funding is needed to ensure the Department of Design and Construction and other agencies can pay for the work and are sufficiently staffed to oversee the significant increase in retrofits. We've already seen that a lack of funding has decreased confidence in the ability of the city to effectively enforce the law. It is fortunate that the state legislature is not, is likely not moving forward with the governor's proposal to undermine local law 97 by allowing the purchase of renewable energy credits. Yet significant concerns remain among lawmakers about whether the law is enforceable. The best way for the city to rebut these concerns is to properly fund those city agencies who oversee its enforcement. Lastly, the New York City Council must ensure that fines for noncompliance are high enough to incentivize retrofitting. We remain concerned that without sufficiently high fines, owners will consider Local Law 97's fines a cost of doing business in New York City and will thereby not move forward with retrofitting their buildings. Again, thank you for holding this important hearing today. We hope the City Council will heed our warnings and ensure that the city has the resources to enforce this essential legislation. Thank you, Adam. It uh, looks like Mara, there's a, a chair. A council, Rosenthal has a, a, a question. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Roberts, I, something you just said caught my attention that the city has not achieved the goals that it had laid out. Do you mean for city government buildings or private buildings or both? For, for city buildings, um, because of the uh, year long halt in design work uh, over the course of the pandemic, which led to a year long halt in uh, sure, sure. construction work. It just means that the city hasn't been doing what, what some forward looking private owners have been doing, which is retrofitting their buildings uh, with knowing that they'll have to start complying in a few years or at least within the decade. So According to the testimony this morning, they said they were ahead of the game, that they were beyond where they thought they were going to be at 25% They're at 40%. What, so do you hear something different than I'm hearing? Because I understand the point you're making, and I definitely drilled into 
how are you going to spend as much money as you think you're going to spend over these this four year window given the pause and blah 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 and they admit it they're not going to be able to make it but is that what you are referring to I, i'm just trying to make sure i understand it yep that's exactly what we're referring to okay. um you know we what we hear is from our members who who work for the city and uh, you know they're doing heroic work at DOB, DDC, and other agencies, but there needs to be more of them doing that work, and there needs to be more of that work actually being done. Great, thank you so much. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. I'd now like to welcome Carlos Castell Croak of the New York League of Conservation Voters, whose testimony will be followed by Linda Nguyen of Align. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Carlos Castell Croak, and I am the associate for New York City Programs at the New York League of Conservation Voters. And while CV represents over 30,000 members in New York City, uh, and we are committed to advancing the advancing the sustainability agenda that will make our people, our neighborhoods, and our economy healthier and more resilient, I'd like to thank Cares, Constance Needies, and Rose and all for the opportunity to testify today. During Mayor de Blasio's first term, his administration set many ambitious goals to fight climate change, including reducing emissions 80% by 2050. In the years since, we have only seen incremental steps towards meeting these goals. Throughout this time, NYLCV has maintained that the single largest step the city can make uh, to meet 80 by 50 is by drastically reducing emissions from buildings. The building sector in New York City accounts for a whopping two-thirds of our total emissions. But thankfully, the building emissions reduction targets set by Local I-97 will ensure that roughly 20,000 buildings in the residential and commercial sectors, sectors do their part to fight climate change. These new standards put us on a path to reach 80 by 50. However, NYLCV understands the work is just beginning. Ensuring that the law is properly implemented provides a clear and achievable regulatory framework and adequately, an adequate enforcement and investment are critical next steps. The Office of Building Energy and Emission Performance, or OBEEP, will be responsible for these next steps and therefore must be fully staffed and funded. Previously, we estimated that OBEEP would require $2 million in the fiscal 20 budget, the fiscal year 20 budget, um, and the city should incrementally increase that to $20 million by the fiscal year 25 budget to ensure that they have the necessary resources for the first year of regulatory enforcement. We're concerned that OBEEP is currently understaffed when it comes to tackling local I-97 implementation. And furthermore, we could see additional cuts. Uh, they could see additional cuts due to the COVID-19 budget crisis. We ask the city council fully fund OBEEP so that it can effectively implement local I-97 and, and help us drastically reduce emissions in the building sector. We also recognize that the working groups created by local I-97 to make recommendations on implementation are meeting regularly. And we urge the city to shepherd these groups through their work and issue preliminary regulations as expeditiously as possible so that building owners have as long of a lead time as possible to come into compliance with the law's requirements. Finally, we urge the mayor to commit publicly to redirect all non-compliance penalties once Local I-97 has taken effect to energy efficiency retrofits in affordable housing, which for the most part exempt from Local I-97, but no less in need of retrofitting. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Carlos. I would now like to welcome Linda Nguyen of Align, whose testimony will be followed by Maritza Silva Farrell, also of Align. Time starts now. Hi, unfortunately, Maritza was not able to make it today, so I'll be the um, only person testifying for Align. My name is Linda Nguyen, and I'm the Senior okay. Policy Analyst at Align the Alliance for Greater New York. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, we also want to take, thank uh, you, Chair Constantinides, for your leadership on this effort, among many others. Um, so after Hurricane Sandy, Align brought together over 50 local community groups to form the Climate Works for All Coalition. After almost six years of organizing, Climate Works for All successfully led the passage of Local Law 97 in 2019. It's been two years since this historic win, and now the coalition urges the city to focus its efforts to equitably and aggressively implement Local Law 97. As many before me have already stated, buildings are the largest emitters in the city. They're responsible for about 70% of the city's greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, a report recently stated that emissions have actually been increasing in recent years. And so we cannot afford to wait any longer. Not only will Local 97 target the city's largest emitters, but will also create about 40,000 good green jobs. Experts also project, as Chair Constantine said earlier today in the hearing, that it has the potential to expand 
the current uh, retrofit uh, annual, the annual retrofit market by 13 times what it is today. Buildings can reduce emissions with today's technology. A 2019 study found that a combination of aggressive energy efficiency improvements, electrifying systems, and renewable energy generation are necessary to meet the, the city's 80 by 50 goals. The city must take this opportunity to invest in the communities that have been hard, hit hardest by the climate change crisis, as well as COVID-19, especially as we transition into a new administration. The following four considerations must be prioritized during implementation to keep the integrity of this landmark legislation. First, environmental justice communities, affordable housing, and NYCHA buildings must be prioritized within Local Law 97 implementation, especially for siting and retrofits. Second, the city must ensure community hiring practices and project labor standards are enforced on all projects. It's not enough that we're creating these jobs. We wanna make sure these are good green jobs that folks can um, make a living wage off of. We also wanna make sure that staffing for local 997 continues to happen and that it must go towards public jobs. And finally, trading mechanisms that harm environmental justice communities and reduce emissions reductions like RECs or Part R must be limited and addressed through the advisory board. If the city is serious about protecting its residents and ensuring a robust economic recovery, it must move to aggressively implement Local Law 97 to make sure inroads um, in addressing racial inequities are being made. We're creating good green jobs for folks and fighting climate change expeditiously. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Please give Thank me right you. to my dad. Linda, uh, now I would like to welcome Danielle Manley of Urban Green Council, whose testimony will be followed by Sonel Jessel of WE Act. Time starts now. Hi, um, dear Chair Constantinides, Chair Rosenthal and committee members. First, I wanna say thank you to Chair Constantinides for all the work that you've done to move climate progress forward in New York City. Um, my name is Danielle Manley and I'm Associate Manager of Policy at Urban Green Council. I'm standing in for Chris Halfnight who couldn't be here today. Urban Green is a nonprofit dedicated to transforming buildings for a sustainable future in New York City. And we offer three recommendations related to the oversight of Local Law 97. First is to increase funding for the implementation through the Department of Buildings Office of Building Energy and Emissions Performance or OBEEP. Local Law 97 has the potential to drive billions of dollars of investment in New York City buildings, which will bring important benefits like lower pollution, lower utility bills, and greater health and comfort for New Yorkers. And that successful implementation of Local Law 97 depends in large part on adequate funding for a dedicated team at OBEEP. Urban Green recently joined in a letter with many other organizations to advocate for more funding for Local Law 97 implementation. OBEEP is doing an excellent job with limited resources, but we remain concerned that the office's staff and funding are not consistent with the tasks at hand, like developing many of the highly technical details, facilitating a large advisory board process, driving outreach and education, and eventually managing compliance and enforcement. The OBEEP leadership is best placed to speak to detailed budgetary needs, but we support increased staffing and dedicated funding for technical analysis to advance the work. The relatively small sums required will repay many times over by driving successful compliance, climate progress, job creation, and economic development as New York City recovers from the COVID-19 crisis. Second, we want to ensure that the city leads by example by electrifying public buildings. Over 40% of citywide carbon emissions in New York City come from burning fossil fuels for heat and hot water. To reach our 2050 climate targets, we'll need to retrofit many of these buildings to replace fossil fuel systems with highly efficient electric, sy electric systems, particularly in the multifamily sector. And the city can help jumpstart progress on electrification with its own buildings as it upgrades its stock to meet local law 97 targets. Specifically, we urge the city to fund a small number of electrification demonstration projects in city buildings, to focus on building types that are relevant to the residential sector, like shelters, senior care, and other buildings with overnight occupancy, to prioritize buildings in environmental justice areas, and to publish project information, including costs and lessons learned. And third, we urge the city to explore a new Local Law 97 compliance option to fund energy efficiency and electrification in affordable housing. In the wake of recent efforts to expand renewable energy credit options, Urban Green joined with a number of other organizations to call for city-led exploration of a better approach to provide flexibility, a new compliance option for owners to pay into a fund that would deliver approved energy efficiency and electrification upgrades that would otherwise not occur in specified types of affordable housing. 
Details would need to be worked out with input from a wide range of stakeholders, but this approach would shift a focus from a grid-centered compliance option to one that would drive investments in New York City buildings and in disadvantaged communities. That would strengthen the law and help, in, help ensure that it meets our climate objectives in a practical, practical and equitable manner. We urge the city to explore this option through a working group under the Local Law 97 Advisory Board process or some other measure. Lastly, Urban Green also supports the bill to require reporting on the city's capital projects, which would bring much greater visibility to capital planning for carbon reductions from city government operations, improving transparency, accountability, and knowledge sharing with the private sector. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today. Thank you, Danielle. Um, and now I would like to welcome Sonel Jessel of We Act for uh, environmental justice, whose testimony will be followed by Nella Pineda Malcon of the New York State Nurses Association. Time starts now. Thank you, Samara. Um, good afternoon, Chair Constantinides and Rosenthal, members of the council, members of the agency are present today. Um, first of all, I'll say thank you to Chair Constantinides for all that you've done for WE Act, specifically the um, amazing ally you've been over the years, even before I started working here. It's, it's been a pleasure to, to work with you and we're very excited for, for you to move on to wonderful things. So thank you personally. Um, my name is Sonal. I'm the Director of Policy at WE Act for Environmental Justice. Over the past 32 years, WE Act has been combating environmental racism in Northern Manhattan. Uh, I myself have a master in public health from Columbia University. I'm here as an advocate concerned about communities we serve in Northern Manhattan, which is heavily black and African-American, Latinx, low income, hard hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I'm here to testify to outline um, what we act sees as continuing needs and important considerations for Local Law 97. Um, I'm excited by Local Law 97 as an environmental justice advocate because of its potential to reduce local air pollution. That is specifically what we like about this law and what we like about the potential of it. We know across the city, it's communities of color, low income communities, immigrant communities that are impacted by poor air quality. We have old buildings that are poorly maintained, inefficient, and some are still spewing those toxins due to dirty fuel oil use for which there's also a bill we must pass immediately about that. Um, that's 980. The people living in communities of poor air quality have higher rates of chronic illness, particularly respiratory illness like asthma, um, heart disease are very high. Across the world, respiratory illness is a leading cause of death. This is a major issue. Additionally, the impact of climate change is hurting our communities first and worst, as we all know, extreme heat, flooding, hurricanes, sea level rise, food insecurity, vector-borne diseases, infectious diseases, and more. Um, for these reasons, it's vital we not just reduce our greenhouse gas emissions overall, but we really focus on reducing the local air pollution. That needs to stay central, motivating goal of Local 97 and deciding how we implement it. If we're considering that, then the, the, the process for implementing it becomes energy efficiency concerns. Um, so I'm asking for a few considerations here. First, echoing what other folks have said around staffing OBEEP. We only have six staff members. I imagine they will be very overwhelmed by what is to soon come um, with the process of having thousands of buildings reducing their energy use and coming to this office for help for that. To ensure it's done well, um, you know, we want to make sure people get the resources they need, implementation, help, adherence to the law is tracked correctly. Uh, we need more staff. We need like double the staff at least. Um, Second, we need to not pursue a carbon trading study that leads to any emissions increases in environmental justice neighborhoods as compared to other neighborhoods in New York City. That is so vital. We must also clearly have a plan for evaluating the effectiveness of carbon trading and be prepared with a mechanism and actual guidelines for when we turn carbon trading off if it's not doing what we need it to do. Um, that's something that, you know, I know the carbon trading study is thinking about it, but I think it's really important that our council members also are really aware and watching for that. How are we making sure we turn it off if we need to turn it off? Um, third, the answer to funding Local 97 is not renewable energy credits as a lot of other people have stated um, with state intervention. It's not market-based solutions that don't reduce local air pollution and do not improve energy efficiency in buildings. If we want buildings to improve their efficiency, we must provide the funds for buildings that can't afford it. Um, and particularly for buildings in environmental justice communities, particularly any profits that come from Local 97 implementation 
or any related programs such as carbon trading must not go to a general fund, but go into a specific fund specifically for subsidizing the cost of energy efficiency Time expired. for owners. Um, so if we want massive energy efficiency improvements to happen, we have to make those funds available very quickly and just give it widely. Um, so that also echoes what Urban Green was saying. Uh, importantly, um, there's a board created specifically to make these decisions to guide this implementation process. We need to look to that board along with those city agencies to make the decisions. In no circumstance should we be circumventing this board. Um, so thank you very much for your time um, and happy to answer any questions. And thank you very much. Chair Constantine, once again. Thank you, Sonal. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. I'm really you know, value the partnership with We Act, and, and thank you for your partnership over the years. And of course, I, I miss Cecil very much. So he's always in my thoughts, and We Act are always in my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sono. And now we'll turn to, and I'd like to welcome to Nella Pineda Marcon of the New York State uh, Nurses Association, who will whose testimony will be followed by Carlos Garcia of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nella Pineda Marcon, and I work as a nurse at Mount Sinai Morningside and Mount Sinai West. I am also a proud union member of the New York State Nurses Association. I serve as a director at large, and I'm chair of our Climate Justice and Disaster Relief Committee. NISNA represents 43,000 nurses across New York State, including 25,000 RNs in New York City. This includes nurses in all of the city's public hospitals. As nurses on the front lines of patient care, we have seen up close the horrors of COVID-19 pandemic. Almost 32,000 people in New York City have died and countless others have been left wounded physically and emotionally. We have seen the deep impact that the pandemic has had on low income communities of color. The disparities are all encompassing, affecting marginalized communities physically, mentally, and economically. We know that this is just a few, a few, a preview of what lay ahead if we do not take climate change seriously. It is critical that we heed the warning. In fact, we have already seen the destruction that climate change and environmental degradation has had on the health of our patients. Increases in heat have contributed to an increase in hypertension, pollutants that are being discharged into our city air, causing a steady increase in chronic asthma conditions in our most vulnerable communities. In addition, these communities also face environmental injustices like contaminated water supplies and tainted soil. They are also the, one, also the ones that are usually hit the hardest by cath catastrophic events such as Superstorm Sandy. And this is not okay. Let me clear. The New York State Nurses Association is 100% in support of a fossil fuel free city. We should be doing everything that we can to speed the reality along. We need to move ahead quickly like our house is on fire because it is. Let me clear, the New York State Nurses Association is 100%, um, I'm sorry, we are proud members of the Climate Works for All Coalition, a coalition of unions climate and environmental justice organization and advocacy groups. We fought hard to ensure that local 90, law 97 was enacted and now is not the time to slow down in its implementation. Although the pandemic brought a lot of things to a screening halt, buildings are still emitting incredibly harm, car, harmful carbon emissions. Local law 97 will cut down on emissions create good green jobs and create environmental justice equity. Environmental justice is always a key priority for us. Marginalized black and brown frontline communities often bear the brunt of harmful pollution. Local law 97 will dramatically reduce this pollutants and will eventually reduce all covered 
NYC building emissions by 80%. We must limit the use of harmful trading mechanisms such as renewable energy credits that ultimately harm environmental justice communities. We have an opportunity with local law 97 to create 40,000 good green jobs for New Yorkers. We urge this body to commit to prioritizing labor standards expired. throughout its implementations. We must start staffing up regardless of any hiring freezes. This should be public jobs and include the hiring of city workers. If we can roll this out with all these critical pieces in place, we can ensure that local law 97 isn't just saving our planet, but it is doing so in the most equitable way possible. A real economic recovery is on the horizon, and we are confident that implementing local law 97 in the ways that we have outlined will only help to spur this on. Thank you for your time and consideration today. Thank you for your work and, and to the Nurses Association, thank you uh, for being on the front lines every day. Uh, today is my one year anniversary of being diagnosed with COVID pneumonia. And uh, it was the nurses and the, the medical professionals at Mount Sinai um, that saved me. So I really want to, from the bottom of my heart, uh, for the work that you do every single day, I really just want to thank you for your service to the people of New York. Thank you. New York, thank you. Thank you, Nella. I would now like to welcome Carlos Garcia of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, whose testimony will be followed by Laid. Jade Losada of Triage. Time Thank you, Ms. Now. Watson. Thank you, Ms. Watson. And uh, Chairman, please, uh, again, I think uh, Nija, of course, echoes all the sentiments uh, of the previous speakers and saying how much of an honor it's been to work with you and all the meetings we've had and, and all the ambitious um, policies that you've put forward um, that have taken into consideration not only our input, but, but other community organizations all around New York City. We very much value that. And, and we look forward to, to continuing to work with you in the future. We know you're going to do amazing things everywhere you go. So you always have an ally here. You always have a friend. And uh, as we say, you're always invited to the cookout. So please do, uh, please do join. Um, so good morning uh, again, Chairperson Constantinides and members Diaz and Nero Levin, Menchaca and Orlik and, and everyone else. My name is Carlos Garcia. And on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, I'm here to testify in support of a complete and, and equitable implementation of Local 97. Founded in 1991, uh, Nija is a nonprofit citywide membership network linking 11 grassroots organizations from low to middle income and communities of color in their struggle for environmental justice. Uh, New York City had a New, New York City Environmental Justice Alliance has a long history in the, the fight to develop renewable energy in New York City and state from its instrumental role in passing the state's Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act uh, to leadership in passing Local 97 through Climate Works for All Coalition. Nija has always prioritized New York City's fight for environmental justice over expediency or the easy route, and we will continue to do so. Following the passing of Local 97, Nija has remained a constant presence in its implementation process, from being an advisory group member to our active participation in the technical advisory committee tasked with researching the viability of a building level carbon trading compliance mechanism. Through this process, Nija has and continues to advocate for Local 97's equitable implementation projected to reduce New York City's building emissions by 80%. We continue to be concerned by false solutions and loopholes that will weaken energy efficiency mandate, including building carbon trading, carbon offsets, unchecked renewable energy credits, and even building level carbon capture technologies. Um, by equitably uh, enacting Local 97, New York City will help create more than 40,000 clean energy jobs that will not only help reduce harmful localized pollution levels in environmental justice communities, but will also provide New York City the opportunity to establish labor standards through the laws implementation to help out uh, out of work New Yorkers uh, and provide them the help that they so desperately need. Major promises to continue to help uh, by providing feedback and direction to the city of New York to ensure the city's economic recovery from COVID-19 will help the city transition from pollution infrastructure to a cleaner economy through a just transition framework. And uh, I would like to extend our gratitude for allowing Nija to play such a crucial role in the formation and development of New York City's energy policies. And we look forward to continuing to be an ally to those who join us in our fight for environmental justice. Uh, so again, thank you so much to everyone and um, we continue to, to lead and, and fight the good fight. Thank you, Carlos. <clears throat> uh, Chair Rosenthal has a question. Yes. 
Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Garcia, I just wanna ask for your ex expertise, your what was your response or thought when you heard the city say that it's met, that 60% of its work has been in EJ communities? Do you think, what, do you think that was accurate? Thank you so much for your question. Uh, you know, I, to determine whether it was accurate, I, I think it's really tough, right? And I know we, we tried to meet with DCAST numerous times and we have, I think the last meeting we had was pre-COVID on the winter before or maybe the wind, uh, it's all kind of blurring, but it was a long time ago. And I think the um, impression that it left us was there was a lot of effort, there was a lot of effort and a lot of development um, a long time ago. Um, but as of recent, um, there has really been a lack of emphasis on these kinds of programs, not only on solar and community buildings, public buildings, um, but just just the development of, of, its, of its mandates as a whole. So. You know, of course, with COVID, things have been pushed back, and um, now we're facing a whole set of different types of austerity measures to a different mm -hmm. type of development measures to restrictions and so on and so forth. And, you know, we really welcome having another meeting with DCAP to see what updates from our last one that they've made. Um, but, uh, you know, I think I echo everyone when we say most people, including um, probably yourselves, in this line of work are usually underpaid and overworked. Um, mm -hmm. And the same goes for all the offices that are gonna be created and all the people that are gonna be tasked with, with implementing this law. So um, again, we, you know, we welcome an update from DCAS and a more detailed um, analysis of all the work they've done as of late in the last three or four years. Um, and, you know, based on that, we can give you a more concrete answer on um, whether or not uh, we believe or our sentiment from the things that they said uh, publicly in the past and, and even now so today in, in this morning's hearing. I mean, one of the things that I think would help is some sort of tracker by building and by, you know, tool used, whatever it is, to improve um, efficiencies, you know, so, so one of the things that I think is frustrating is this idea that the city can report on its portfolio um, rather than individual buildings, um, which is why I was pressing them on, you know, if you have if you have the portfolio information, surely you have the details that go into it, so it wouldn't be so hard to just present by details. At which point we would know the answer as to whether or not this was happening in uh, EJ communities. Um, Absolutely, Assemblywoman, and, and, I, and I think I echo you. I think that that kind of tool would definitely not only help transparency and also help targeted procurement approaches to specific areas, right? So understanding what areas are hit hardest by air pollution or what areas even just economically would be the easiest to retrofit and provide efficiencies or you know, distributed energy resources. Um, again, I would just say, um, you know, providing more guidance to DCAS and, and, and measures so that they kind of are more pressed to make a, a program or a tracker like that might be a, a very advantageous tool for all of us to, to work in and around in the future. You know, they said that they'll be coming out with some sort of um, roadmap in the next few weeks. I'll count on you and other of the advocates who are on this Zoom to give us feedback on, on what, what the city puts forth. Um, I'll be really interested to hear your point of view on it. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. We look forward to providing that feedback as well. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Carlos, as well. Thank you for your partnership. And, and I second uh, Chair Rosenthal's uh, comment here that, you know, a portfolio is only as good as the pieces that go into it. Um, so it would, it would really sort of benefit all of us to understand what buildings are being prioritized, what work is being done. I know that $60 million was put in in 2019 and additional dollars were put in in 20, uh, 2020's budget, which is technically FY20 and FY21. But knowing which buildings have been retrofitted and how they've been retrofitted and what are the results of those retrofits would go a long way in us understanding uh, where, what we're targeting, what the criteria is, and how we're benefiting communities. In addition to reducing emissions, uh, we're also going to see a, a, you know, a better air quality in those communities by not burning fossil fuels. 
So we should be thinking about these issues all the time. And you know, it's not just about big picture fighting climate change, which is extremely important, but it's also about the, the improving the air quality in environmental justice communities and in every community as we do these retrofits. Thank I, you. I was muted. Yeah, no, I, I, Chairman, I, I completely agree with you. And I think, again, right, that level of detail is important and that level of detail would be great. And um, it just requires um, staff and funding. Um, you know, that level of energy impact assessment on how um, impactful different types of strategies for energy efficiency, just energy demand side management strategies as a whole, um, it, it's very technically um, intensive. And so, you know, I think that's something that we would absolutely love to help um, develop, something that we would absolutely love to, to be in the conversation about what areas to, to analyze first or what buildings to really monitor first that are really going to be most insightful to how we move forward in our strategy procurement. Uh, procurement. Um, so yeah, again, I, I, we echo the, the same sentiment that of course more, more detail and granularity, granularity um, in, in program implementation is, is always better. And uh, again, we, we welcome the, the ability to participate at uh, the discussion project development discussion level in, in any sense. So thank you again. Thank you, Carlos. I would now like to welcome Jay Lozada of Triage, whose testimony will be followed by Alep Shapanka of the Real Estate Board of New York. Time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Jade Lozada and I'm a policy organizer of Triage, which is a youth climate organization that is also a member of the Climate Works for All Coalition. First, I want to thank both of the chairs. Um, in the summer of 2019, I heard both of you speak, Chair Rosenthal, at the New York Historical Society during a Girls Right Now event, and Chair Constantinides at the New York Society for Ethical Culture because I was one of the climate strike organizers. I was really grateful to hear both of your visions for the city and it made me so happy and lucky to be under your leadership as a New Yorker. Um, so yeah, and it was my introduction to the world of like local politics, so thank you. When the council passed Local Law 97 as part of the 2019 Climate Mobilization Act, everyone saw the benefits that it could provide. Up to 40,000 green jobs, an 80% reduction in building emissions, and better environmental standards for frontline and by POC communities. But looking further down the road, Local Law 97 is not about the current state of our city, but where we want to be and what we'll leave for our children and grandchildren. Young New Yorkers should not have to rely on buildings or any other infrastructure that help destroy their own future. A strong local law 97 means a better future for my generation while shortcuts and false promises like renewable energy credits only hide the harm being done to communities in peril. Funding NYCHA retrofits stopping cap and trade, and fully investing in OBEEP ensures that the spirit of the law is upheld. As we've watched many of our parents lose their jobs over the last year, or older siblings struggle to enter the workforce in a recession, we question the security of our own futures. Not only would Local Law 97 put many of our family members back to work, it would provide an employment path for the 60,000 annual high school graduates entering an economic recession. And it would signal to youth that New York City cares, that City Council is not afraid to take on the ambitious programs that we as young people desperately need, and that our economic futures will help mitigate the greatest threat of our time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jade. Uh, and I would now like to welcome uh, Alex Shapanka of the Real Estate Board of New York whose testimony will be followed by Ryan Minnell, also of the Real Estate Board of New York. Time starts now. Uh, thank you for the time and the opportunity. I'm actually going to defer my time to my colleague, Ryan Minnell, because we only prepared one statement. So Ryan, if you would like to be unmuted, I'll defer to you. Time starts now. Well, thanks, Alex. And uh, we'll, we'll both be available for questions, but. 
Uh, Chair Constantinides, Chair Rosenthal, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. And congratulations as well to uh, Councilman Constantinides for uh, your, your tenure on the council and, and for your future endeavors. Uh, looking forward to working with you in the future. Uh, Revenue agrees with the council's intentions of decarbonizing New York's building stock. As many of our colleagues in environmental and envir in environmental justice um, have just outlined, this work is imperative for New Yorkers, particularly our most marginalized residents. But the approach it adopted is deeply flawed and needs to be amended if we have any hope of achieving a more sustainable and equitable New York City on the timetable mandated. Local Law 97 generalizes building types and usages without taking into account the density of the occupancy, tenant energy consumption, and the carbon intensity of the energy inputs, most of which are beyond a building owner's control, but will result in an owner being penalized, in some cases, millions of dollars come 2024 for any failure to comply. Paradoxically, the council ultimately decided to impose rigid carbon limits on private building owners. It gave itself a percent reduction model for its own buildings. The city is holding private building owners accountable for limiting their carbon emissions, but will was not willing to, to hold itself to the same standard. With no discernible plan to retrofit each building it owns, the city's apparent strategy to comply with its most more practical standard starts and ends with buying hydropower from Canada in a maneuver that widely cri critiqued by environmental advocates, something the, the de Blasio administration has yet to make this investment a reality. The city has failed to live up to its environmental commitments. Its own data shows New York City has moved backward, not forward. The city's carbon emissions have gone up in the last few years and remain effectively unchanged since the Bloomberg administration. Instead of reducing carbon emissions, the city simply increased taxes on many owners. It will unfortunately likely now be the responsibility of the mayor and the city council to develop a real plan to address our climate crisis. Council member Rosenthal, Rosenthal's pre-considered legislation being heard today would be a good start. We are ready, willing, and waiting to work with the council and the city to seriously deal with our urgent environmental issues. We appreciate the opportunity to testify and appreciate any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay. Chair Rosenthal. Thank you. Yeah, I just have a quick question. Um, where do you um, appreciate your testimony? I'm wondering about the um, and and kind words about my test my legislation. I do think it'll help us understand what the city is doing better. So thank you for that. I'm wondering if Rebney as a body, as a trade association, has done work um, of looking around the country and the world for best practices to reduce carbon emissions for um, buildings to see what's happening in other places and how we can, how you can, you know, help your buildings achieve these goals. Certainly. Yeah, I think, you know, first and foremost, you know, what your legislation intends to do, which is creating greater accountability and, and, and transparency around, you know, where capital dollars are being spent, but but also, uh, and perhaps more importantly, or equally as important, you know, what is being done to make sure we're lowering the emission levels of, of, of city owned buildings. Um, and, and we share um, in that priority, uh, because we, we understand how important it is to really do what we need to do to make sure um, you know, we're, we're creating a more sustainable city. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Alex, is it, it's okay, Samara, and, and, and Chair uh, Rosenthal, Chair Constantinides, you might have some insight on your question. Thank you, and sorry we have to do unmute game tag here. Um, you know, some, some of our members have shown leadership with the world's sustainability in inventing the first big platinum building in the world, uh, the first high-rise massive house tower in the world. Did, did you hear me? Or did... That's okay. So I, I can restart. So the point is that I think a lot of our membership has demonstrated leadership and actually is on the forefront of, of the, the, to answer your questions. Like we've, some of our members have invented the first lead platinum building in the world, the first uh, high-rise passive house building that are 
high rise building that meets housing house standards. And I think the, the real question, and if I can be so bold as to put words into your mouth, council member, is that I think the real challenge that I don't think we have an answer for, or even the city council has an answer for, is how to retrofit the 950,000 buildings that are not addressed by Local Law 97. I think that's going to be the largest challenge that we face in terms of both financing and practical application, because those buildings account for more than half or around half of the city's carbon emissions in the built environment, and those still remain unregulated. And I think our membership is is working towards and is willing to make the concessions that necessary and has been doing the, the retrofit work, I think probably for nearly 20 years in many of the portfolios from, from their own um, corporate standards. But I think what's the real challenge that we'd be willing to brainstorm with you all and we'd be willing to make our membership available uh, is to try to figure out how do you address the smaller buildings below 25,000 square feet and how do you get those um, retrofitted to, to improve the air quality in those communities. Because I think a lot of the what we're gonna see is if you map out where those buildings are, largely are in communities of color, environmental justice communities that aren't really impacted or covered by this law. So what I'm hearing you say, Alex, is that um, the problem isn't the 90,000 buildings, that you think your members you know, the, these, these larger buildings will be able to get there. You've got some real leaders in the city who are paving the way for others. They have good models um, for how to achieve these goals, but the larger problem is the, the actual problem is, is all the buildings that are not touched by this bill. Is I that what you heard you say? I wouldn't go so far as to say when that's not a problem. The five percent of buildings that are covered by the law do account for half the, the built environment's carbon emissions. I think the the challenge is, I think those owners have the the capability and have a plan to reach them. I think they're trying. I think some of the the metric that was adopted under Local Law 97 makes it extraordinarily unachievable for some of the more energy efficiency build uh, energy efficient buildings in the city, primarily because the metric doesn't account for density of occupancy the type of work that's being done in the building or the energy inputs or the carbon intensity of the energy inputs. So electricity and district steam. I think for most commercial buildings in the city, about 50% of the carbon emissions related to them are come from things beyond the, come from the um, carbon of the energy inputs, which is electricity and district steam, which is beyond a uh, building owner's control to be able to retrofit. So you have some really energy efficient buildings that are going to pay a couple million dollars of fines until the energy inputs get cleaned. So I think in the short term, it's really hard for some of those buildings to comply with the law. I'm sorry, again, I'm just wanting to make sure I'm hearing you. So 5% of the 90,000 have that hurdle. Sorry, 5% of buildings in the city are covered by local law 97. I would, oh, I would sorry, sorry, sorry. So of the 90,000, I don't know why I have that. So of the 5% of the buildings, yeah. how many are gonna have that challenge? That I don't know off the top of my head, but I, I, from our membership, anecdotally, there's a lot. I mean, I know of one on the West side. So uh, I'm curious. I can name, I can, if we want to talk offline, I can give sure. you some, some examples. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to know that, but. But it sounds like, and I don't, again, don't know what a lot means, but um, I'm just trying to understand of the 5% that uh, yeah. cover 50% of carbon emissions, um, I hear this what? one challenge, um, I'd like to learn more, but um, I think the yeah, I, I, is there's just to underscore the fact that there's for one that there's more buildings that need to be covered and the city has no plan to do that right now and we're happy to, to brainstorm and help you figure out a way to, to achieve that and two those that are covered some in the very short term have no way to comply but to play, pay penalties just because of the carbon inputs that they're building That's sure it. sure I mean of course you know the city would be interested in hearing a little bit more of those but about those, but for the others, um, sounds like they're on their way to getting it done. Yep. Great. 
Okay, thank you. Very, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. I see Councilman Gennaro has a question. Time starts now. Thank you. Yes, I, I listened to your testimony with great um, 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 with great interest, and um, you know, I I, I was just uh, uh, sworn in the end of February. Of course, I did a lot on these. Um, you know, uh, 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 I did a lot of bills in this area when I was on when I was on the council. <clears throat> but you uh, said something that you know caught my attention that. Uh, you know, um, Councilmember Rosenthal got into a little bit, but uh, I want to pursue a little more. Um, when you talk about some of the most energy efficient buildings getting jammed up by local on 97 with regard to um, inputs to their buildings that they don't control, could you just kind of like elaborate on that a little more and how and 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 how state of the art are these buildings that you're talking about that could be subject to penalties? Sure. And just, and you know, whether it's um, appropriate to talk about it right here, right now, just give me like a little flavor and then we can follow up on this. But um, what are we talking about? And, and what, 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 what caliber buildings in terms of, and uh, uh, how, you know, green they have been constructed um, would be subject to penalties. If you could just, kind of probe that just a little bit, like not so much to make a whole dissertation on it, but just give me a little yeah. more flavor for that. Of course. So I think something has been widely covered and I think we've seen it in, covered in the New York Times and the Washington Post. So feel free, I think we can mention it explicitly here. Is one Bryant Park, which was the country's first lead platinum building, is set to pay over $2 million in fines annually starting in 2024, because, which hyper energy efficient building, but it also happens to be the Bank of America Tower because they have 24 seven trading floors and their hyper density within the building itself. And because of the servers within the building, their electrical consumption in the building outpaces a lot of other like commercial occupancy. So like a, a law firm, for example, mm -hmm. might have be the same specs as one Bryant Park, but because it's spaced out and because the type of use and the times of use within the building, has no problem complying with local law 97. But there's not much else that you can do to some building like one Bryant Park in the next five years, 10 years until the energy inputs are clean. Uh, and, and, and how many buildings with, with, with this effect? Is this like a, is this a phenomenon or is this just, you know, reserved for a handful of buildings? So within our membership, there's, there's quite a few. I, 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 we can look at the data that we have and, and get back to you. With the same, similarly, with uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, we can have a conversation. Um, but don't know off the top of my head, we can look it up though. And I think the city might be able to tell us based on, you know, come July 1, there's supposed to be an application deadline for um, alternative compliance themes or uh, adjustments to your carbon caps for buildings that have shown that they can't become more energy efficient and comply with the law. Um, but we're still waiting for those applications or guidance to come out. So maybe once that's out, if we, you know, Rebney can tell you about our membership, but the city will probably be able to tell you about the larger scope of buildings that might not be able to comply because whenever that comes out. But, but just to add to that council member, I mean, just to, to create more clarity around the question and provide you with an answer. I mean, we're hearing, uh, substantial concerns from our membership that, you know, come 2024, they're, they're going to be in it. There's going to be an inability to comply, which is really not the, what, what our members want. I mean, our members want to be sustainable. They want to find solutions. They want to work with the city time uh, to, to lower emissions. Um, it just looks like they're going to be paying fines here come 2024. So mm -hmm. it's not anecdotal. We can get you more information that's data driven um, offline, but Something we certainly want to work with with the council okay. and the city to, to help. Thank you. Thank you. Our, 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 our time has expired, but thank you very much. <clears throat> I, at this time, I'd like to ask if there's anyone else who's registered to testify, but whose name I have not called. If so, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function.
All right, seeing none, I will turn it over to Chair Constantinides for any closing remarks. Uh, Chair Rosenthal, do you have any closing remarks before I go? I could keep going on about gratitude for you and your tenure here on the council um, for a little while longer, um, which obviously I just did. But I also want to thank, again, the staff who helped put this together. I see Rebecca Chasen, um, John Seltzer, Nathan uh, Toth, and Noah Brick, and also my staff. Um, Madhuri Shukla. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. And thank you for your great partnership on this legislation and many other pieces of legislation over the years. Um, one of the things I'm gonna miss most about the council is, is working with colleagues like you and, and you've been a great friend and a great colleague over the years. So I know you'll continue to do great things in the council and, and I'm gonna look forward to catching up with you uh, when the world allows. Uh, so, I mean, I think we have today really sort of begun to probe issues around the, with local law compliance as far as the city level. And I know that we're gonna hold uh, New York City to a high standard. Uh, you know, a portfolio, as we said earlier, is only as good as the pieces that go into it. And I think the, the uh, pre-considered uh, introduction today will go a long way in ensuring that we understand which buildings are getting retrofitted and how we're doing that. And ensuring that New York City continues to lead the way on local law uh, 97 implementation. Um, so really, I just want to thank uh, Speaker Corey Johnson, who's been a great environmental leader in his own right, and thank him for the opportunity that he's given me over the years to be chair of this great committee and you know, to be able to have passed 58 bills through this committee since we've begun my chairmanship in the past 44 bills. Uh, thank you, Speaker Johnson. Uh, thank you, Speaker Mark Verito, uh, for your great work and partnership over the years. Uh, thank you to all the staff again, uh, Samara Swanston. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we've known each other a long time and your commitment to the people of the city of New York has always been unwavering. Thank you, Samara, for being amazing. And Nadia, thank you, Nadia Johnson, thank you for being an amazing policy analyst uh, and, and a great partner uh, for getting these big pieces done. Uh, Ricky Chawla and, and Jonathan Seltzer as well. Uh, thank you for making this committee what it is and the work that you do. Uh, and to uh, uh, my staff, uh, Nicholas Wazowski, uh, my, my legislative director and counsel who's worked on all this legislation, even my brother and my, my partner in this through the whole way. So all I can say is, you know, the successes that we've shared in this committee are all of yours. Um, so uh, you should own them and be so very proud. And I'm proud to have known you and worked with you. And uh, to each and member of my staff, thank you. Uh, to all the sergeant at arms, uh, Helen Rosenthal staff, uh, thank you. Uh, central staff, you are a great, amazing public servants that every single day wake up. And you know, we get to be on the outside, right? We get to be our, we're constantly front facing as council members, but as staff members, the central staff of the city council do so much every single day. Your amazing public service is what makes this institution work. Without you, our work does not go as far. Um, thank you to the great public servants that each and every one of you are in central staff that do this great work. I applaud you. I'm in awe of you. Thank you for doing it. And, and to the amazing advocates, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll do one more round of applause for central staff, but to the amazing advocates that take of their time and have been partners over the years. If I start naming names, I'm going to get myself into trouble, so I won't do that. I'll just say thank you for uh, being the amazing advocates that you are and partners and you know, passing Local 97 was a large part of working with the advocates and getting these, these big pieces done. Uh, so but the work continues. And this work will, was always supposed to continue after my tenure and will continue well into the future. It's something that, but you'll be holding us all accountable. And I'll be joining you in that private sector to hold New York City accountable. So thank you for the work that you do. And with that, I will take my son's uh, he gave me this gavel uh, to chair to chair the last hearing, so I will gavel this committee hearing of the Environmental Protection Committee for my last time as chair. Thank you, Councilman Gennaro, as well um, for passing me this gavel over the years. Uh, I'll, I'll gavel this committee hearing of the Environmental Protection Committee closed for the last time.